The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Russia's deadly protracted assault on Ukraine has led down many paths over the past 11 months, but so far not towards peace. Tonight, what's needed to bring the war to a lasting conclusion, and does it entail an existential crisis for Russia? Or, as we'll hear from author Ian Garner, do Russian nationalist narratives make the tragedies of war useful fodder for a dangerous future? It's Wednesday, January 11th, and that's next on The Agenda. Next month, tragically, it looks as if the world will mark the one-year anniversary of Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine. It's been merciless, unrelenting, horrific, pick your adjective, but as Ukraine continues its remarkable resistance to the invasion and more and more military aid flows from Western powers to help, is there any hope for peace soon? With us now on that, let's welcome in Vienna, Austria, Velina Chakarova, director of the Austrian Institute for Europe and Security Policy. In Midtown Manhattan in New York City, Walter Russell Mead, the Ravenel B. Curry III Distinguished Fellow in Strategy and Statesmanship at the Hudson Institute. And here in our studio, Janice Stein, Bellsberg Professor of Conflict Management and founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Janice, great to have you back here, first thing here in the new year. And to our two guests out of town, we're grateful you could join us for this important discussion as well. Walter, I want to start with you because you recently came out with a column in the Wall Street Journal called, It's Time to Prepare for Ukrainian Peace. And you had five criteria in that that the United States would like to see if peace were to happen. And let's just quickly share those with our viewers here. Point number one, the war you say should end quickly. Number two, the war should end in true peace. Number three, the end of the war shouldn't set the stage for the next war. Four, the end should make clear that Russia's aggression did not go unpunished. And five, the war should not end with the dismemberment of the Russian Federation. Okay, we are going to pick these apart as we go through our discussion here, but Walter, let me start with this. Absent from your list, is whether the territorial integrity of Ukraine needs to be respected. How come that's not on the list? Because it seemed to me, Steve, that, that we're going to end up uh, trying to deal with the military situation on the ground. We can't predict at this point what it is, what that will be, but we have to start thinking about now what we want as an after state. Um, you know, per, my, per, if you ask me my personal preference, it is Ukrainian territorial integrity on the 1991 lines to be reestablished. But the god of war may speak uh, about something else. All right, let's pick another one of your points here. The end of the war shouldn't set the stage for the next war. How does the world, in your view, make sure that that doesn't happen? Well, there's several things. One is that clearly the security guarantees that Ukraine had in 1995 and subsequently were not sufficient. Uh, maybe we're talking formal NATO membership. Maybe we're talking about some other form of, of treaty ironclad guarantee. But Ukraine needs, Ukraine needs to come out of this war with recognized, defended boundaries and the diplomatic and military backing, if need be, to protect its independence. Let me follow up with Valina on that, because one of the points, number two, is the war should end in true peace. Valina, when you hear the expression true peace as it relates to Ukraine and Russia, what does that mean to you? Well, first and foremost, uh, obviously, uh, the um, uh, goals of uh, Ukraine and Russia in this war are um, are quite uh, opposite. So that means that uh, there will be true peace once uh, Ukraine wins over Russia, or uh, that will be, of course, the ideal case, or Russia uh, at least partially achieves its goals in the war. 
So there won't be a peace treaty so long as Russian troops are on Ukrainian territory. Uh, Ukraine has only two options uh, as of today, um, ahead of the first anniversary, namely between a war or a complete subjugation. So um, the option of the war right now is the better option from Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's point of view. But even from Russian point of view, as of today, at least uh, the minimum goal would be to establish control over the Donbass region. Uh, and uh, that is still not the case. 40% uh, of the Donbass region, including Donetsk and Lugansk, is actually not under a Control. So, uh, to um, uh, wrap it up, uh, we are far away from uh, true peace uh, as of uh, today and ahead of the first anniversary. And of course, decision makers in the West, in Europe, in the United States and other partners do want to see the options between war and peace. But like I said, uh, we have to face the reality as it is and not to, um, well, to uh, think in normative uh, terms. Janice, can you imagine a quote-unquote true peace that allows Russian troops to remain in the eastern part of Ukraine? That is one of the two biggest challenges here, uh, Steve. The other is, of course, Crimea which is even more difficult uh, to think about because Crimea was annexed by Russia in 2014. So when I look at Walter's five conditions, uh, we are very far away. And some of them, in fact, may never be achievable. But I think, um, Walter, you're making a more fundamental point that we tend to think of this, Steve, as Fight or make peace. <laughs> fight or prepare for negotiations. That's not accurate. It is fight and prepare Both for negotiations. simultaneously. Yeah, and I think we are not doing enough now of the hard preliminary work uh, to get ready uh, and to provide the kinds of options, first and foremost to the United States, which plays an extraordinary role in this whole story, um, but even to engage uh, indirectly both responsible Ukrainians and responsible Russians in these kinds of discussions, which always take place long before they become official. We're not doing enough. Let me get Walter on that. Do you think, uh, do you agree with Janice that there's not enough going on diplomatically behind the scenes to lay the groundwork for the five conditions you've put in place? Well, as always, I think Janice cuts right to the chase. And uh, the, she made, I think, really just excellent points, as usual. Uh, we're, the thing is that, you know, in World War II, and I wrote about this in the column, you know, the, the Allies had, all, the Americans had already begun to think about how to end World War II before we were in it, so that Roosevelt and Churchill signed the Atlantic Charter before the United States was at war. So thinking about what you want from peace and thinking about what you want the outcome of the war to, to, to be is something that, that you should be doing from the beginning. Janice's additional point, which is very strong, is that there needs to be some kind of communication, back-channel communication. People sometimes talk about things like track two, track 1.5. The trouble is in today's Russia, uh, you can't, there's not a lot of room for people that want to be part of those track 1.5 or track 2 conversations. Putin does not, is not at the, at the moment interested in having people explore back channels. There are, however, people in Russia who are known in the West, who um, are, are, are serious thinkers. We should be engaged with them, but again, not over the heads of the Ukrainians. Uh, the Americans, uh, we need, you know, everybody involved in this war needs to be thinking about what do we want to come afterwards. By true peace, by the way, I don't mean sitting together and singing Kumbaya, <laughs> but what I do mean is that what we don't want is 2014 2.0, where in other words, Russia is holding some territory, the legal status is is disputed and we are putting Russia under all kinds of sanctions. Uh, what we want is a return to sort of normal international life. Now, when I list these five things, I don't think we're going to get them quickly. 
Uh, and as Janice points out, we may not get some of them at all, but but it's what we need to think about what we want and then do what we can to get as close to that as possible. Valina, let me get you to react to a view from the United Kingdom. This is from someone named Julian Lindley French, a geopolitical analyst, who had the following to say. There is no reason to believe Moscow will seek any peace agreement worthy of the name in the short term, and any calls for a ceasefire would merely consolidate Russian gains. Rather, Russia will attempt to coerce both Ukraine into submission and outlast Western partners. Moscow believes lack the strategic patience and political cohesion for a long war. Could you, Valina, tell us what your view of the so-called strategic patience is of the Western and or NATO countries? Well, first, I absolutely agree with uh, this opinion uh, of my colleague. Um, and uh, in fact, it's important to understand that uh, the short term game of Russia is exactly uh, this to actually present itself as the rational player. Uh, which seeks peace talks, which uh, offers a ceasefire, um, as it happened during Christmas time, and uh, at the same time to present Ukraine as the irrational player that seeks a prolongation of the war. And by doing so, so uh, we need to understand, uh, given the experience from previous frozen conflicts and uh, wars that Russia conducted in Eastern Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, but also in Eastern Europe, that uh, this kind of. Uh, uh, breaks, uh, frozen conflicts and so on, are in fact the perfect excuse to legitimize already um, the, the already, um, uh, let's say, um, the territorial gains of Russia. In this case, uh, we talk about 17 percent of the Ukrainian territory. So that is what I was trying to explain, that in the short term there will be no, uh, no uh, peace talks. When it comes to the strategic patience, here this is the second part of the Russian game. Um, Russia is playing for time, is hoping for at least one country uh, in uh, Europe, ideally Germany, uh, so a big, uh, big uh, member state of the European Union, uh, to face a situation of political turmoil, uh, where a government would, uh, for instance, collapse. Uh, this happened with uh, Italy, based on uh, its um, policy towards uh, Russia, but uh, the new coalition government uh, turned out to be even more pro-Ukrainian. And uh, Russia plays for time because it really wants to strike against this uh, uh, strategic patience uh, approach. That means that the Western sanctions are working. It means also that the Western uh, system, so Western uh, weapon systems deliveries are in fact efficient, as we've seen with the two important counter offenses by Ukraine. And um, these two important pillars of the Western approach may produce, may trigger, let's say, a tipping point uh, for the Russian system, for the Russian economy, but also for the Russian war machinery. And this is what Russia tries to prevent. Well, let me pluck from that answer something, and Janice, put it to you, and that is the notion of weapons delivery, because we have seen France announce that they're going to be sending light tanks to Kyiv. The United States and Germany followed a day later, saying they're sending their own armored vehicles to Ukraine. Does this look to you as if those Western powers are still betting on Ukraine? There's no question the Western powers are still betting on Ukraine. Um, and to a degree, I think that few thought possible. But let's go back to Walter's comment for a moment here, Steve. The gods of war are unpredictable, mm. right? So one of the things we know is that the West, including the United States, has depleted its stocks to an, I mean, to an almost unbelievable degree. It, it really is shocking that there were so, rounds of ammunition are now mm. scarce. Uh, those two were two big announcements. In one case, three tanks. In another case, a few more. Those are not game changers on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. So the reason I said what I did earlier is, frankly, there are multiple outcomes to the, on the battlefield that are foreseeable six months from now. The Ukrainians have fought with incredible bravery, but there is still the capacity in Russia to mobilize. Um, at a significant level. Well, that was and, the fear over Christmas, wasn't it? That yes. by, calling, by Putin calling this ceasefire, 
the well, idea was. I, I actually think that was completely unrealistic. You can't mobilize in 36 hours in any meaningful way. That was really done for, for Russian domestic politics. They have it too. Uh, we are not the only ones who have it. But over time, there's certainly, Russia has more to throw at this. Um, it's not exhausted. And the sanctions actually have done shockingly little damage to the Russian economy thus far. So it's in that broader context of uncertainty and unpredictability uh, that we, I'll come back to Walter's point earlier, that we start to do the planning. That is not a pause in fighting. In other words, doing the kind of hard work, thinking hard about trade-offs, because nobody gets everything they want, nobody gets everything they want. Doing that policy work uh, and engaging, not over the head of Ukraine, but with Ukraine. Who's supposed to be doing it? Well, that's what good governments do. Let me put it to you that way. I think that there are already some back-channel negotiations going on uh, that are appropriately confidential. But I think we need to do much more. And why is this so important, Steve? And Walter actually didn't mention this. You have to get domestic publics ready mm. for results that don't match the rhetoric. And this is a perennial wartime problem. Zelensky is extremely exposed with his own public. They are rightly enraged, but he will have an enormously difficult time. Um, some of the Western governments, and particularly uh, in Eastern Europe, the, the states that are closest to Russia, um, this is, there, there are going to be some very bitter pills to swallow here. And if governments aren't doing that work now, they're making their own lives much more difficult at the other end of this. Okay, Walter, I'm going to get you back in here let on me, one of the let items. Let me underline. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I, I think that I want to double down on this uncertainty thing because it's not just the battles in Ukraine. Suppose the suppose Putin decides to make a, an end run and goes to Iran and says, "Listen, we'll help you get over the line." And de and and Iran has a nuclear test. How does that change where America is? What it thinks about in terms of its of how many arms it can send to Ukraine? Suppose China declares a blockade of Taiwan. There are a lot of things that nobody controls that could shake up the chessboard enormously. And, you know, the surprises could go the other way, too. Russians could start deserting in droves from their units. But war is, by definition, unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And and we've all, I, I think what we see is a policy discussion and a press discussion that sort of assumes that what we're looking at today is roughly what we'll be looking at in six weeks, 12 weeks, a year. It isn't necessarily. Right. While you've got the floor, Walter, I want to put another one of your five items to you from your Wall Street Journal piece of a month ago, and that is the war should not end with the dismemberment of the Russian Federation. And, um, well, let me read an excerpt here. This is from the deputy director of the International Center for Defense and Security in Tallinn, Estonia, who's written a piece called Don't Be Afraid of a Russian Collapse. Sheldon, would you bring this graphic up? Middle of page three, please. It is ironic that Western Europeans are more afraid of escalation than countries closer to Russia, even though the latter would be directly affected by any escalation of the war. Being the object of Russia's imperial policies from the 1700s to the present day has taught the Baltic countries and Poland to fear Russian strength more than weakness and to fear Russia's potential victory in Ukraine much more than its defeat. The Ukrainians' courage and determination to defend their independence is a historic chance for the United States and Europe to deliver a decisive blow to Russian imperialism and toxic nationalism. But so far, the major Western powers hesitate to throw their weight behind this outcome. Okay, tell us why you think a dismemberment of the Russian Federation is something we should not desire. Well, I'm old enough to remember the collapse of the Soviet Union. And at that time, uh, uh, the American government was terrified of thousands of nuclear scientists, nuclear devices running around completely unconstrained. Uh, we did a lot of work, um, some of it wiser than others maybe, but in the end, we managed to contain that. But this, the, the actual dissolution of Russia 
let's think about the human cost in the Caucasus, in South, in 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 the part in Chechnya. Uh, the wars that might break out between Azerbaijan and Armenia on a much larger scale. Let's think about where China would be, what China might do in that situation. Uh, it's a it's a catastrophe. And then we should also think there are a lot of, you know there are millions of Russians who are not responsible in any way for what Putin has done. What happens to them in that situation? Does that actually enhance European security? I agree with the Estonians, the Poles, and the Ukrainians that a, that a strong Russia is a threat to them. That's why I believe in a strong NATO alliance, and I believe that the, that the war should end with Ukraine having ironclad security guarantees. But that, I don't think those, it's much harder to protect someone from chaos than from a power. And I, there is nothing to be gained, in my mind, from the collapse of civil authority and the outbreak of strife and war in Russia. Didn't, didn't, didn't make anybody happy in World War I. I don't think it would make anybody happy today. Let me get Valina. Janice, I'll get to you in a yeah. second. Valina, where do you stand on, this, on the question of this being a unique historic opportunity to deliver a decisive blow to Russian imperialism? Indeed, it is a unique, uh, unique moment, and uh, in fact, uh, we are facing this kind of uh, bifurcation within Europe uh, between the Franco-German bloc, which is pushing for, as I said, the status quo, coming back to the status quo before the war began, which I think is unrealistic. And then, of course, uh, Central Eastern European countries, but also the Nordic countries. Uh, think about the fact that two neutral countries, the one being neutral for the last 250 years, the other for uh, you know, for more than 70 years are now joining NATO this year. Uh, this is also showing actually uh, how um, how unique the moment has become. I think that um, um, we all indeed uh, share the same interest on both sides of the Atlantic that, um, in fact, uh, a dismemberment of uh, the Russian Federation, dissolution of the Russian Federation, a weakening of uh, this uh, imperial uh, project geopolitical project is in our uh, common interest uh, for the reason that uh, neither the United States nor the European powers want to face a two-front scenario in the future, given the real challenge coming from uh, China. So this uh, modus vivendi of coordination that I was talking about just a year ago in your show, Steve, ahead of the beginning of the war, this is the real problem, the threat multiplier coming from Moscow and Beijing, while Beijing is realizing that it needs to protect its uh, border in the north, it needs to have security uh, that is guaranteed by Russia while facing uh, rising India and also military escalation with Taiwan. So obviously, uh, a weakened Russian isn't in the interest of the West. And I argue also that um, um, uh, the dissolution of uh, the Russian uh, Federation may present Russians and hopefully the new generation uh, within Russia with uh, new opportunities. We uh, should look at uh, uh, Russia as being under complete control of one specific clique of the KGB-like clique of people. This is not uh, 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 a country that is being ruled by checks and balances the way how the West understands it. And this is not in our interest to have a KGB-like rule country that operates uh, in our direct vicinity. So obviously, uh, we should go for this, uh, for sure. We leave it to Professor Stein to break the tie. Well, I, I disagree. Um, with quite, which one of them? I disagree with Valentina quite strongly. First of all, the argument that uh, the solution to this lies in the dissolution of Russia assumes that any conceivable Russian leader um, is expansionist and imperialist. Not the case, you know. Well, it's, no, it's not the case. You know, Russia has been a power in Europe for centuries. And if you look back at the 
imperialist expansionist powers, uh, Russia takes its turn with everybody else, but it does not have a monopoly. I'd sort of just make that as the organizing assumption that every, any conceivable Russian leadership is going to be expansionist, I think is questionable. Secondly, um, dissolution brings with it, as Walter says, chaos and risk. And let's talk in detail. Uh, Walter talked about it very briefly. When the Soviet Union broke up, Ukraine had Russian Soviet nuclear weapons on its soil. It took three years of arduous negotiation, and that's where we got the term loose nukes, mm -hmm. right? And loose nuke scientists, uh, and it, it was a priority of the U.S. government, and Ukraine voluntarily gave them up. And by the way, if it hadn't, it might not have found itself in the situation. I was going to say, do you which think they regret finds, that decision I'm today? I'm sure they, they regret do. that mm -hmm. decision. I have no doubt about it. But it was done because of the fear, not of nuclear proliferation from one state to another, but because there would be loose nuclear weapons. Now, I can tell you that there is no part of the Russian Federation that would break away here, and if there are nuclear weapons on their soil, that would return them. So just think of the nightmare that the world would face under those kinds mm. of, under that situation. I, I, it's very easy to gloss over this. It's frankly a nightmare and would pose just mm. enormous risk to Central Europeans, to East Europeans, and to everybody else where we define ourselves. I really do not think this is what we should wish for. All right, Walter, let's return to the first point on your list, which is the war should end quickly. And I guess I'd like to start by asking you, what's your definition of quickly? <laughs> And how optimistic are you? Well, I would, <laughs> I would like it to end tomorrow on my terms. Yeah. But, uh, yes. That's unlikely. Yeah. I don't think we're going to get a quick end to the war, but I think we should be trying to do what we can to make the end come sooner rather than later. The damage only increases as the war goes on. The crimes committed make, make reconciliation or even stability harder. Uh, the emotions get higher, the damage is greater, and also the, the tests both of Western solidarity and the risks to Russian coherence grow over time. Plus, I think there are other powers out there that are already finding ways to benefit from this situation and will continue to do it. So I think, in, in my view, that really translates now into trying to make sure, make it clear to Russia that it's not going to win. Putin still believes that he has some options on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I think our, our strongest policy, we should be working very hard to, pre to, to check Russia's military operations, to give Ukraine what it needs to, to, to gain. But at the same time, and this is in the context of Janice's earlier remarks, you know, making sure those back channels are open. It's like, Russia, you cannot win, but Russia, we're not trying to destroy right. you. Hmm. And somehow in that space, at some point, hopefully, there is room for some kind of an agreement. But again, by invading Ukraine, Putin has unleashed a torrent of events which neither he nor we can really fully control. So we can have goals. There's no guarantee that we're going to achieve them, but we should be working at it. That at least would be my view. Well, let me follow up on that with two other voices who are urging speed uh, in the end of this thing. And, uh, well, you know their names from national security uh, positions in the past, uh, both out of Washington. We agree with the Biden administration's determination to avoid direct confrontation with Russia. However, an emboldened Putin might not give us that choice. The way to avoid confrontation with Russia in the future is to help Ukraine push back the invader now. That is the lesson of history that should guide us, and it lends urgency to the actions that must be taken before it is too late. Rice and Gates. We know yeah. those names from the past. Uh, okay, Valina, do you want to weigh in on that? Do you uh, share their view on that? Once again, I'm in a very convenient position because I agree with this uh, quote as well. And as I said, as we're speaking, Russia is preparing for the next escalation 
face is mobilizing at least another 100,000 uh, uh, reserve troops uh, which will be deployed at the front lines and uh, is applying a kind of a hybrid uh, approach uh, while destroying the critical infrastructure of uh, Ukrainian cities and villages and terrorizing Ukrainian population. It is preparing for the next offense, most likely in Donbas. So we are far, far away from uh, any peace talks. And of course, the minimum goal, once again, will be to legitimize at least those territorial claims uh, and gains uh, that have been achieved so far in the four illegally annexed regions. Um, that means I that I just don't see any ground for uh, peace talks uh, in the short term. I honestly don't see uh, the war, the war uh, being over in this year. We are in an attrition war. And as I said, uh, both uh, war parties are currently convinced that they can decide the outcome of this war uh, in their favor. And I think that the West um, is uh, um, applying the right approach for the moment uh, by uh, intensifying the weapons uh, systems deliveries uh, to Ukraine, by uh, meanwhile um, launching nine packages of sanctions. I think that these uh, together, uh, or let's say coupled with uh, the next uh, Ukrainian counter-offensive, uh, offenses, maybe the next one will be conducted uh, um, also ahead of the anniversary, the first anniversary, or maybe uh, in March. Uh, but uh, definitely Ukraine is preparing for the next counter-offensive. And um, based well, let me on pick up on that, actually, Valina, if I can. We may see... Because yes. we got a minute left to go here, and Janice, I want to put it to you. And uh, the next offensive, the Ukrainian Defense Ministry is predicting that in the spring, a half a million Rus Russian troops are going to be mobilized for this conflict. What does that do? Well, I don't know. I, you know, I don't think it's half a million, but it's certainly additional Russian troops will be thrown at this. I have no doubt. The, the Ukrainians are doing their level best. Um, they are anticipating an offensive as well. So I, I think there's very little doubt that we're going to see, as somebody described it, bloody fighting in a war of attrition in mm. the Donbass that is reminiscent, frankly, of the horrors of World War I, mm. where forces move forward a yard or two and face enormous casualties. So we're going to go through a really, I think, brutal spring, but it's out of those kinds of battles. When did we get discussions going to go back to that war in World War I? When governments made the decision that the price simply was not worth hmm. the gains they were making on the battlefield. And depending on what this spring brings, we may be in a very different strategic um, position after these offensives, and that's why I, it's, you know, I keep saying, let's do some of the hard thinking now. Um, but the battlefield always drives the pace of negotiations. Mm -hmm. But the two go together, Steve. They're not either ors. Understood. I want to thank the three of you for your contributions to our program tonight. Janice Stein from the University of Toronto, Walter Russell Mead from the Hudson Institute, Valina Chakarova from the Austrian Institute for Europe and Security Policy. It's great to have you three with us again. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Harrowing, terrible stories emerged from the months-long do-or-die battle for Stalingrad between Soviet troops and Nazi Germany in World War II. But according to author Ian Garner, as awful as some of those stories were, they became indispensable narratives for a certain kind of Russian nationalism. He brings that history to light in his new book. It's called Stalingrad Lives, Stories of Combat and Survival. And Ian Garner joins us now on how that past continues to inform generations of Russians. Ian, welcome. Great to have you here. Hi, thank you for having me. One of the great ironies of the title of your book, Stalingrad Lives, is that Stalingrad is no more. Do you want to tell us what's happened to the name of that city? Well, of course, it is a name with a vexed history. Mm. Stalingrad literally, Stalin city, Ville, 
Kingston town, Stalingrad. Became briefly Volgograd, of course, and in that time, the idea of the Battle of Stalingrad disappeared completely in the 1960s. But since the 90s, when Russian nationalism has become increasingly resurgent, the idea of Stalingrad has become resurrected. It's become emblematic of a story of Russian utopia, Russian sacrifice, and Russian success. And we're seeing its importance today, of course, in stories about Ukraine. But it's still called Volgograd today. Well, it is, except if you go on holidays, when for some days every year, including, of course, Victory Day, the 9th of May, the town once again becomes Stalingrad. Hmm. Okay. Can I tell you a weird little story here? Of course I can. Of you're course. my guest here, so sorry you're going to have to listen to this. Before I cracked the cover on the book, I saw the title, and I thought to myself, Stalingrad lives. Okay, it, it lives, it endures. But I also thought, it could be read, Stalingrad lives. As in, you're about to tell me the story of the lives of people who survived that horror uh, all those years ago. Um, which is it? Well, I'm glad you spotted it, that it is absolutely both. In one sense, this rallying cry, Stalingrad lives, that we heard both during the battle in 1942, when it really looked like the city was on the brink of collapse and all that stood between the Wehrmacht, Hitler's armies and their allied armies, of course, and what looked potentially like victory in the war was Stalingrad. And Stalingrad clung by a thread the Soviets sent more and more troops into battle, and every day for several months, all Soviet readers of the newspapers, Soviet radio listeners heard was that Stalingrad is about to collapse, yet miraculously. And really, this is a religious idea, a miracle. Stalingrad continues to live. And yet, on the other hand, Stalingrad has perpetually had this afterlife. It's been something that Russians, patriotic Russians, nationalist Russians, and many Russians who are let's say much more ordinary figures and might not identify as extreme nationalists or patriots have built their lives around. They identify with this as an important element of their identity. And thus was born a myth of Stalingrad, which continues to inform Russia today. What's that myth? Well, the story in a nutshell is, and this was produced, as I talk, talk about in the book in some depth, at the front, in the trenches, the story goes, that a million people, a million Soviet soldiers at Stalingrad died in order to save the world. The city itself symbolically died in order to save the world. There is this messianic idea of sacrifice, and you'll start to hear, see here this almost Christian idea of sacrifice. It's not a regrettable sacrifice that a million people died. We wish we didn't have to do that, that there was some other way. The idea is much like the story of Jesus in Christian legend or Christian myth, these people had to die. They had to be martyred to save the city, to bring the country and bring the world back to life. And stop fashion, stop Nazism. Exactly. Hmm. How different was that myth, as you've just described it, from the reality of what transpired 80 years ago? Well, in many ways, it's striking that much of what occurred at Stalingrad was well reflected by Soviet writers at the time. And in the book, I delve into how the Soviet Union sent its finest novelists, men like Vasily Grossman, the famous author of Life and Fate, to the front. And they actually documented what was happening pretty accurately, recorded their thoughts and feelings for Soviet readers as they felt the city was on the brink of collapse, as they felt the city was dying. And yet somehow the Soviets pulled a miracle out of the bag won the battle with quite an astonishing counterattack in November 1942. And these people felt that this miracle really had taken place, that somehow they'd gone from staring defeat in the eye to believing that a march to Berlin and victory in the war was possible. If there's one thing I suspect people have heard as it relates to this battle 80 years ago, 80 years plus ago, it's that as, as Russians retreated at some point, other Russian soldiers shot them uh, to, to, to you know, scare them into turning around and continuing to face the Germans. You tell us in this book that kind of thing didn't really happen very much at all. Is that right? Well, the sad reality is, to a certain extent, it did happen. 
something like 10,000 Soviet soldiers were executed by their own sides at and around Stalingrad. And this is a huge battle. It's not just restricted to this small city. It's taking place on a front that is hundreds of kilometers long. And the reality, of course, is 10,000 executions is awful. It's unspeakable, it's horrific, but by Soviet standards and by the standards of a battle where a million people died in six months, this is almost vanishingly insignificant when we look at it on this numerical scale, at least. Instead, what we see is a real surge of patriotism and enthusiasm from really the beginning of the war and then centered around Stalingrad, this do or die moment. And Soviets were keen to go to the front. They were asking to go to the front. They wanted to go to Stalingrad. They wanted to defend their land because they believed, as Russians today believe of Ukraine, that by fighting this war, they are avoiding the possibility of total obliteration at the hands of a genocidal army. Russians believe that, or the head of Russia believes that? Well, today, many Russians do believe it. Of course, the head of, the head of Russia, Putin, does very much believe it. And it is surprising to me, as I've conducted research for my follow-up book, that a number of Russians, a large number of Russians, probably 20 to 30% of the population today, do buy a much more extreme narrative and do believe that Russia is under an existential threat coming from the West and embodied in Ukraine. What is the difference, then, between how... Western interpretations of Stalingrad from 80 years ago sit today compared to Russian versions of what Stalingrad now stands for? Well, I would say that the Western story of Stalingrad is all about the cult, the suffering, the inhumanity, the futility of war. I and mean, we probably all have that image of freezing soldiers in the trenches in the city at the top of our mind. Maybe people might remember Enemy at the Gates, the Jude Law movie from... Was it the late 90s, early 2000s? Fabulous I don't movie. Remember. It's a fun movie. Fun right? movie? Well, fun in the Hollywood sense, but of course it's, it's a sad movie. Yeah. But for Russians, this is a story that brings something like warm feelings to the surface. Feelings of pride, feelings that it's Russia that's owed something by the world for having made this sacrifice on behalf of the rest of humanity. Russians, at least, who follow this narrative, and I would say that's the majority of the population when it comes to this myth of World War II, will tell you that Americans, Westerners, don't understand us. Is that a fair point? I think it is unfortunate that in the, in the West, we don't pay much attention to what happened on the Eastern Front. Historically, you know, our war movies are all about D-Day. We rarely mention the Eastern Front. We rarely mention the size of the sacrifices on the Eastern Front. And yet, at the same time, what's missing from the Russian story, of course, is the fact that at the same time as Stalingrad was happening, there was fighting in North Africa that was distracting the Axis forces that was actually helping the Russians. America and Britain were providing money, lend-lease, arms and equipment to Russia to keep that fight going. Allies who don't understand each other very much even all these years later. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's, uh, we're going to do something kind of quirky here. We're going to play a little bit of a clip. This is the Red Army Choir, and they are singing The Sacred War. That is a marching song written just after the German attack on the Soviet Union in 1941. And this song takes place over images of that time. Shall we? Perfect. If you would, the clip, please. <laughs> a sense of what Russians today think when they see and hear that? I would say Russians have a sense of deep nostalgia and pride. In the West, we have this phrase around the war, never again. We don't want a repeat of this. We don't see that sense of pride. We regret the fact that it ever happened. For, but for patriotic Russians, the phrase is, we can do this again. 
And that's what's coming through in the present, the idea that war today in Ukraine reiterates this march to the front, this glorious sense of, and it's funny that the name of that song, Sacred War. This is something sacred, it's something quasi-religious, it defines us. It may not reflect the reality of the past entirely, but it reflects a mythical time when Russia was strong, when Russia was doing great things for the world, and Russia was somehow fulfilling a historical messianic mission. Здравствуйте. Привет. Как дела? Очень хорошо. Okay, I'm just making the point that um, even though you've got an English accent, you've lived in Russia, your Russian is very good. How come? I was always fascinated when I first started learning Russian many years ago by the idea that Russia is on the brink of Europe. Moscow and Petersburg, these people look European, they feel European, and of course, when I was getting involved in this game in the early 2000s, it was a time when Russia seemed to be edging its way towards Europe. And yet these mindsets still persisted. The pride in the war, the differences, the rejection of so many things that are European, and of course what we've seen in the past 20 years is that the scales have tipped very much in favor of rejection of the Western European and anything that can be labeled as Western. And isn't that fascinating that this culture could be so similar to our own and yet so utterly reject us violently, aggressively as they're doing today? Let me pick up on that. Here's an um, excerpt from your book. Putin's pilgrimages to Volgograd, you write, tap into a rich vein of emotion that courses with hope, religiosity, and the sense of a unifying national epic. By invoking the text of Stalingrad, a novel by Vasily Grossman, in his 2018 speech, Putin was encouraging listeners to reflect on the nature and interrelation of personal and national pasts, so as to prompt them to conclude that the new can emerge from even the most hopeless situations, even from death itself. What kind of connections do you see? I know you touched on this, but let's go here again. The myths of Stalingrad and the brutality, frankly, of Russia's attack on Ukraine. Well, here we see the idea that, as Putin promises, by refighting the Second World War, supposedly today, the war in Ukraine is a war against Nazi invaders, fascists who are committing a genocide against what Putin terms ethnic Russians in the east of Ukraine. And Russians once again have been called on to fulfill their historic duty to save the world, save themselves from this threat. It's all you know, completely detached from reality. But the promise is by fighting and by dying, the culture, Russia can somehow be spiritually renewed, reinvigorated as happened in that miraculous turnaround at Stalingrad again. And I use the word pilgrimages in this little passage that you know, that Putin makes pilgrimages. This is like a religion. It is detached from reality, but we have to understand that it's an article of faith, that no matter the level of personal sacrifice, that might today mean economic sacrifice, you can't go to McDonald's anymore, your trips abroad aren't happening anymore, the ruble is, let's say, struggling in various ways right now. But if you watch your sons and brothers even die at the front, they're dying for a just cause. And this phrase, for a just cause, is a phrase that is often picked up on and used by Russian politicians. And Russians don't find it passing strange that allegedly the leader of this Nazi Ukrainian country is Jewish. They don't consider how crazy that sounds? Well, of course, the entire discourse around the war today is subjected to a number of contradictions. Most obviously the contradiction with reality. But the discourse today has been corrupted, so that Russia is not being attacked just by Nazis and by the Nazi party, party led by Hitler. It's being attacked by a civilization, by the West, by liberals, by homosexuals, by queers, by Jews, anything that is considered non-Russian, and that's a flexible term that changes in meaning depending on what's most convenient to the Kremlin and the Kremlin's propagandists, Anything non-Russian needs to be destroyed. Anything non-Russian is a threat. And all of these things are synonymous. Being a liberal means being queer, means being degenerate, means being Jewish, means being Ukrainian. So logic goes out the window, and instead what we have is this amorphous bag of enemies. Okay, let's do a little 
Viraj here because you've got another book coming out yes. in a few months' time. It's called Z Generation, Into the Heart of Russia's Fascist Youth. And it starts with a portrait of a 19-year-old named Alina. Why don't you give us a snapshot of who Alina is and why she is exemplary of Russia's fascist youth? So Alina is a 19-year-old that I dug out through social media networks. And Alina lives in Nizhny Tagil, which is a pretty godforsaken post-Soviet city, a thousand miles from Moscow. So this is not a member of the sort of cosmopolitan teenager youth that you might have heard about fleeing the war and going off to Kazakhstan, Georgia, or anywhere else that you can get hold of a plane ticket to. And at the beginning of the war, Alina, who is fairly well off as it happens and likes to go to Moscow, has been abroad many times, likes to travel, dreams of a big career in the tech industry, started to join these nationalist groups on VK, which is Russia's basically Facebook in terms of the way that it functions. And these groups spread some pretty dangerous ideas. The idea that Ukrainians need to be exterminated, Ukrainians need to be killed, that they're vermin, that they're diseased, that they represent an epidemic that is somehow infecting Russia itself. And so Alina began to like and share these posts on her VK page. And when I spoke to her, she told me all sorts of quite alarming things about what she believed, that she believed that in Nizhny Tagil, her hometown, they, she might like to conduct a genocide against Ukrainians and against homosexuals. She represents a politics whereby it's becoming normalized in Russian public discourse and normal for very ordinary teenagers who like Western culture and like Western movies. Alina's favorite is Game of Thrones. To also play at this double life and to be sharing and spreading this sort of language where they genuinely believe that the country is surrounded by traitors, by destroyers who are ready to seek Russia's annihilation. Who taught her to think this way? Certainly she learned it in schools. There is a growing patriotic education program in schools. We've seen in particular this year, of course, Alina has graduated school, she's now in university, but this year we've seen new programs to up the level, to accelerate the level of patriotic and ideological education. In popular culture, we see movies, TV shows that express this material constantly, whether it's trashy chat shows, whether it's political discussion shows, whether it's movies about the Second World War, which twist this genuinely heroic narrative of Stalingrad that we've been talking about into something that is deformed and dangerous and that is used to justify any level of violence. And as teens like Alina and her peers talk to each other in closed off VK groups and on networks like TikTok, they egg each other on to say more and more extreme things and create this some sense of snowballing hatred in little bubbles on Russian social media networks. And of course, that is entirely supported by the state. Let us share, again, another excerpt from This Now, your second book, coming out in May, uh, on your less than optimistic take about Russia's future. Can we get this quote up, please? One thing is for certain, you write, the quasi-religious concoction of nationalism, war, martyrdom, and rebirth being poured down the throats of Russia's young today will leave its mark. Everything tainted with the influence of the West, Democracy, homosexuality, difference, the non-Russian is suspicious. Everything Russian is praiseworthy. And everything Russian is under threat. Even when Putin is long gone, this Frankenstein identity toolkit will live on. Let's finish up with this. Uh, I want to ask you about Alexander Dugan, who was a guest on this program, actually, several years ago, a Russian conservative thinker, daughter recently killed in an assassination attempt on him, which went bad and ended up killing his daughter. He said on this program that Russians have a different anthropology, that as far as he is concerned, and here was his quote, to be human is the same as belonging to the whole, not to be a Western liberal individualist, so to speak. Do his ideas, in your view, have widespread uptake among Russian youth today? Well, Dugin's influence is in some ways overstated. He doesn't have direct access to the Kremlin. He never really has had a hotline to Putin or anything like that. He's certainly not Putin's brain, as he sometimes That's what they named. called him, yeah. 
But his influence is on a wider cultural level. Yes, he's a fringe thinker, but these ideas that he spreads around apocalypse, and he reads today's war as an apocalyptic war, a sort of final confrontation between this genuine society with real roots, religious roots, traditional roots, and a West that has become degenerate, depraved, dangerous. He sees that the war today is just the beginning of a conflict that is going to end up with total destruction and then rebirth. Once again, we see this sort of messianic Christian myth at play, distorted, of course, there is nothing really religious about these ideas. And Dugin does appeal to a certain subset of Russian youth. There is a youth group associated with him, the Eurasian Youth Union, that has seen an uptick in membership over the last few months, as has the government-sponsored youth groups and a number of other sort of fringe youth groups. And so this material on social media spreads, drips through the culture and takes on a life of its own, it's very uncontrollable. It's a dangerous concoction. And the state would like to have complete control over it, but doesn't. Because social media enables those ideas to just spread like wildfire. In our last 30 seconds here, you live in Kingston now. Yes. Would you love to go back to Russia someday? I would love to go back, but sadly they have slapped me with personal sanctions and I am not allowed for the foreseeable future. What will it take for that to change? Events that I just don't ever see happening, or not in the next few years. It will take a wholesale move back towards liberalism, and there is no sign that that is going to happen. Well, we're glad that this book has brought you to our studio today, because it's been fascinating talking with you. Ian Garner, Stalingrad Lives, Stories of Combat and Survival. Thanks for the visit here at TVO today, Ian. Thank you for having me. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, January 11th, 2023. Tomorrow, we'll explore how transforming agricultural practices could lead to both better yields and a cleaner climate. Also, is a humble lake near Milton, Ontario, a landmark of the Anthropocene? We'll find out. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.